Amen. And thank you, Henry and Choir, for that beautiful reminder of the power of the Holy Spirit. This today is Pentecost Sunday, a day which is 50 days after the Jewish Passover celebration and a day in which the church took a giant leap forward in terms of its mission. This day, as Christians, we celebrate that the Holy Spirit that set above with God Almighty from the very beginning when God and the Son and the Father were all as one in the creation of the world, descended upon all flesh and gave every person who called on the name of Jesus Christ new promise, new direction, and new power. It is with that power, my friends, that we can become fully alive. Hearkening back to that quote of the great second century saint in St. Irenaeus who said, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. But before you began to think that your pastor is going to be able to exact platitudes and deep theological truths about the Holy Spirit, hear me say this. The Holy Spirit for me is something that is full of mystery and wonder. So if you want definite answers today, I think you might be a little disappointed. The only thing that I can tell you about the Holy Spirit is that I know it's real, I have felt its power, and it has spoken deep truths to me in my own life. I think of one moment in particular in which I was a wayward 19-year-old kid. I had made more mistakes than I had made correct answers, and I found myself in a moment in which I knew that I was estranged from my heavenly father. So it was while in a chapel service at Camp McCall, I asked if I could stay after, after everyone had cleared to go down and get canteen or snack for the evening. In that holy place, on top of a mountain, I knelt before the altar and prayed, and the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart both words of challenge and both words of peace. It was a definitive moment in my personal journey with Jesus in which I knew that the Holy Spirit was real and was calling me forward. Then there was also that time in which I was soon to head to the church where I was to marry Rebecca almost 16 years ago. I, in that hotel room, found myself needing to get on my knees and pray. And the Holy Spirit came upon my life. He spoke deep truths to me, letting me know that even though there were people on the other side of eternity who had passed away, who I wanted to be there so desperately, in specifically my grandfather, they were there in spirit. I was encouraged. I was alive. And then there was that moment at 28 when I finally understood that though God had been calling me to full-time Christian service, it was now my moment to surrender, to take hold of the mantle of being God's minister and to become a pastor to his church. I felt in that moment the peace of the Holy Spirit, but a peace that provoked me to lean further into my relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, I believe that the Holy Spirit is something that descends upon our lives in unscripted fashion, which is perhaps the reason why so many of us miss out on this power. We believe that the Holy Spirit is to come when we request it, and at the moment of our specific need, but if the text today tells us anything, it's that the Holy Spirit will come as it will with violent power that disrupts in so many ways, overturns the narratives of our lives, but then points us in new and hopeful ways where our lives will take on 
deeper significance in which we will fully embrace the power of being fully alive. Sadly, I think the church, lonely as it is, wishes for the days of Pentecost anew within its pews. We wonder, perhaps fairly, can such a power ever be recaptured here in 2022? Can we have a moment in which a rushing wind comes forward, busts through the church doors, and sends us out to exclaim the praises of Jesus Christ in a various form of different language which people will understand and then come to believe? Will we have the power of Peter to proclaim that great prophecy from Joel in which we say, your old man will dream dreams. They will be about business. Even your children will be alive and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Can that power happen today? My friends, I believe the answer is yes. In as much as you and I surrender that we are going to be the ones for writing the script of when and how and why the Holy Spirit is to arrive in our lives. I think we can look no further than those who were gathered in an upper room, almost forced up there. For you see, it was at the same time of the festival of weeks. Jesus had told them previously, don't leave Jerusalem there's still the greater part of a promise that you're yet to realize. The Holy Spirit, or as Jesus said, the helper will soon come, and it is then that your understanding of your purpose will be fully realized. So those disciples and followers of Jesus, some 120 in number, were in the same house, maybe even an upper room. They were there, it says, in one accord, but here's what I believe. Their one accord was in obedience to Jesus, even while not fully understanding what exactly had Jesus been talking about. What had he been talking about when he said to the woman at the well, who was the Samaritan, you must be one who worships in spirit and truth. What was Jesus talking about when he talked to Nicodemus late at night, that great Pharisee and teacher of the law, when he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again by the Spirit? What was he talking about when he referenced to John the Baptist, he who baptized with water, but now there was to become one that was going to be a baptism of fire and spirit? And how does that have to do anything with me. And yet, despite all the mystery of the moment, they were willing to obey Jesus even though they did not understand. Specifically, they were willing to live in one accord, unified despite their diversity amidst 120 despite differences amongst them that were surely no small thing, they came to a similar place and they waited. I don't know about you, but I don't like to wait. Like the great Burger King commercial of old, I like it my way right away, don't you? It's that instruction to hurry up and go to that place and wait that boggles the mind. And I'm sure in that upper room, there was some discussion of sorts. I'm sure they talked about how they sometimes got on each other's nerves. Can you believe this Peter guy? Oh, tell me about it. I had to sleep beside Luke last night. He snores like a freight train. But yet, they stayed as one in one accord hoping, believing that something was to come that would unify their hearts, minds, and purposes forevermore. Something so powerful in the way of unity that despite their many differences, they could never be divided. 
That, my friends, is a powerful truth for you and I today, especially at First Baptist Church, Carrollton. You know, we're what I like to call a purple church. We've got some people who are red. We've got some people who are blue. But here we are all together despite political, social differences, but we are uniquely one in a commonality that that same Jesus Christ who died for all sent his helper and it is that living spirit that is in all of us that brings us to one account and one accord that we people of God have a similar mission that as Peter proclaimed to the masses gathered outside who heard that sound of the mighty rushing wind and similarly came together that we too proclaim that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Yes, never forget that in our obedience, even while not understanding the complete mystery of the Holy Spirit, we are testifying that we have something in way of our common unity as fellow believers in Christ Jesus that is greater than any difference. And it is that that will be a testimony to our world, a testimony to a world that is so bitterly divided in what one person described as the argumentative culture. It's no longer in our social contract that we can hear the differences being opined by another person, perhaps on the other side of the aisle, and respect their point of view. No, in the argumentative culture, we have to belittle them. We have to argue with them. We have to win the day with whatever we see as the superior logic but in what we know to be true, as we win that battle, we lose the war. Because ours, people of God, is to proclaim to all, all that they have a place in the kingdom of God. And in as much as we participate in the argumentative culture, in as much as we belittle and divide further the people that God created in his own image, we might well win the cultural battle, but we are losing the spiritual war, which has the reward for all of eternity. So on this Pentecost Sunday, don't forget what unites us in one accord. Even if you don't understand the full mystery, like myself, of the Holy Spirit, it is yet there, it is yet powerful, and it says to all of us that our similarity in it, our baptism by it, is stronger than any external difference that culture might try to impugn upon us, the church. Oh yes, one baptism, one Lord, and one spirit are we. As the people in the upper room were there gathered, it says that something came upon them. I believe Luke, the author of the text, uses a great metaphor, something that physically happened, a great surge of a mighty wind, but something that was trying to describe a power that was untamable. You see, if you've ever been in a windstorm, you know how helpless you are. If you've ever been like me, trying to wrestle one of those beach tents at Hilton Head Island when there is a strong sea breeze of about 15 to 20 miles an hour, you know exactly what I mean. Anybody out here? You've put that thing up. You've even put the sandbags around the bases it's more secure than Fort Knox when all of a sudden there's an unexpected gust of wind. The tent that was once held so securely in the sand loses its moorings and then becomes the equivalent of a heat sinking missile as it goes projectiling down the beach. You hope and pray that it does not collapse upon any unsuspecting family and then you are left running after it like a complete 
idiot trying to harness it back and save what is already a dented structure. Oh, yes, I'm speaking from personal experience. That is the power of wind. The same wind that in the desert over the many centuries can take what was once a solid piece of rock and make into it some architectural structure which people go and photograph at every occurrence. That same wind that might have put a tree into your house, might have made your kite flow away. The wind is an untamable force, something that comes sometimes with complete and utter surprise and with results that we would never script for ourselves. And it's that power precisely which those in the upper room are willing to surrender to. You see, I think part of the reason why we miss out on the power of the Holy Spirit is because we try to force it into our narratives. We want it to baptize our idea of living. We want it to speak a word over peace in our hearts, but we also are admitting that while we want that message of peace, we are still in a place of sin against God. And the Holy Spirit will never bow a knee to our whim. It will never bow a knee to our sin. So when it comes before us, it calls, but for one and one message alone, that in order to receive it, we must repent of anything that is dividing us from it. You see, when that great wind swept through that upper room, I think that Luke is describing that with it, it carried away all of the past prejudices, all of the doubt, all of the insider bickering of those 120 gathered there. It was a baptism of fire. It burnt up any leftover chaff and left only the wheat, that of substance, for these people to go forward and make a difference for the kingdom of God. And I believe that same wind is a blowing here in our midst, but we must surrender to its power. We must say, I don't want you to agree with me. I want to agree with thee. And in so many ways, we as a people of God, and yes, I'm talking about sin, repent. Heart, mind, and soul of those things that we know are not in keeping with Jesus Christ. That as the word implies, we turn our back to sin and we walk forward to Jesus. And in as much as we can do that, we let go of the senseless things of life which are keeping us grounded and agree to be carried away by a whirlwind of power and the Holy Spirit. Oh yes, today I'm calling on each and every life in mind first and foremost to repent of sin so that the power of the Holy Spirit can be unleashed again in our church. Are you with me? The next thing that that power does once it captivates, once it corrals the people of God is that it naturally sends them forward. How it sends them forward is something differently than they would have ever thought or imagined possible. They are equipped now with a language which suspends all time and understanding. It's described by Luke as one with a flame on top of their head, tongues that are on fire. You see, they are now equipped with a universal language that will go out and preach to all of the thousands who are gathered in the city of Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Weeks. In fact, those people are assembled before that very house where they are, for they too heard a commotion that was undoubtable. And when those people go forward and speak the word of God, they do so with praise. I think the church doesn't experience the power of the Holy Spirit for the first thing that we do when we go out into the world is we speak a word of sadness. 
Perhaps we're reflecting our own inner lives, but we back away from giving people the due that they deserve, which is to hear first and foremost about what is good in our lives. You know, how God has blessed you as of late. How has Jesus worked in your life? How has he brought life from death? How has he given you hope when there was none? How has he given you strength when yours has failed? This is the type of universal language that when we leave these pews, it can intersect with any and all lives whether they be English speakers or non-English speakers, whether they have the language of faith or like so many in our current day have none. I want to tell you today that the power of the Holy Spirit is most first released through the power of your praise. And I want us as a people of God to embrace that mantle to which we are called that when we leave here, we are going and expanding the kingdom because we are proclaiming his praises to all nations. This, my friends, is a power that has no determined result. We don't go forward wanting them to one day come here and sit in our pews although that would be nice and we're open for new membership. What we are doing is we are going and we are trying to expand the kingdom of God so that his grace is known, so that the promise of life is felt and so they too will understand what it means to be fully alive. So, my friends, as we conclude this sermon series appropriately with the beginning of the book of Acts, that what I hope that you have read throughout this series, I want us to go back to that first and most important question of today's sermon. Can that power be felt and received today? The answer is, without hesitation, yes. But I respond to it in the following way. How's your heart? How's your heart? Are you trying to script what God and his Holy Spirit are trying to do in your life? Or are you trying to embrace that great mystery and wonder of God's Holy Spirit? Even though you may not understand all that it entails and you never will on this side of eternity, you're willing to obey because you're committing yourself to a body of believers that despite our differences, we remain in one accord. How's your heart? Are you willing to embrace a power not your own, a power that can come by complete surprise and upend your life and put you in a new different different position, a new direction for life? How's your heart? And are you ready to be pushed forward by the mighty wind of the Holy Spirit, blown out of here in this sanctuary of First Baptist Church and ready to proclaim to any and all gathered that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And by the way, here's how I know God saved me. He took one who was dead. He brought him to life. He took one who was sad and he gave him joy. He took one whose strength was gone and he put them on the wings of evil, of the eagle. How's your heart today? The condition of your heart will determine whether individually or corporately we can receive that power of the Holy Spirit today. So I call on each and every one of you in this invitation hymn that is to follow to take your heart before God Almighty, to let the Holy Spirit blow its winds over you, to speak its truth to you, and to refine within you that possibility which you believed not possible before, so that as you leave this place, whoever you are, 
wherever you might be in life, you are but a partner in this great play of redemption in which all of God's creation are called to be redeemed, to be loved, and to be fully alive. May we pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this great power that you offer. May every heart here be prepared to receive. May every heart here obey even though the mystery is still at large. May every heart here be willing to repent. Will every heart here be willing to embrace this sudden and violent power of yours? And may every heart here be willing to be carried forward with new hope and promise and message. That is between you and them alone, but I pray, O oh God, that they respond, whether it be by singing the text of this new hymn, whether it be by praying, or whether it be by coming up here and speaking to me, the time to respond, the time to give an account of the heart is now. We do these things by the power of your Holy Spirit alone here with us, abiding in us, and living in concert with your will forevermore. Amen.